Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us go, Beach Baptist. Here we are. It's great to be back. My goodness, back from Australia and God's blessing. So I filled you in on all of that. And everybody listening in, we had a great time in Australia with our son, Teddy, uh, our, son, our son, Carl, <clears throat> our grandson, Teddy, <clears throat> uh, Jesse, our daughter-in-law. Just a wonderful time and a great time and good to be back. And got this old bug, but shaking it off now. So if you notice a little bit of a cough, it's just what's left over. So please bear with me if I cough, cough, cough a little bit here and there, but actually doing great. And I want to tell you something. I've, I've just already thanked everybody. If anybody is missing this morning or listening in, I know that Janice will be listening in and Mel, a Presbyterian brother, will be listening in. And so God uh, just want to say that uh, what a blessing, you know, and we got uh, so many prayers and dinners brought to the house and I think I was boasting at one time, I said to somebody, but where could it happen only in a small community? I said, the mayor's wife and the fire chief's wife and the, this, you know, all bringing me food, you know, a little bit of a little name dropping there, you know, uh, uh, very important, you see, and everything. And I thought, geez, that was great. Uh, it was an exceptional uh, experience. And uh, well, actually I did have, uh, my, one of my most famous letters was from the chief of police for Los Angeles, who uh, had been going to Calvary Chapel before he became chief of police and we worked together. And I have a letter, I should frame it, I thought, Hillary, you know, a letter from the chief of police uh, in L.A. and everything, thanking God for this ministry and for helping Chuck Smith through the years and us working together. But anyway, all that to say this, it is great, you know, to, <clears throat> to be back, to be healthy, to be well. And, and, and I'll tell you one thing, uh, Tad Smith and Edisto Beach Baptist is doing something right because there's a lot of love here. And I know the Presbyterian, the Anglican Church too. I, I you know, I, I, I know that from what I hear, and it's a wonderful thing uh, to be in a body of believers where we're looking out for each other. Um, I, and I, you know, I, I honestly can't remember a time I was like sick like that in my 30-year ministry at Calvary Chapel. So I never needed it. I, 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 oh, I, I when I went to the hospital with a heart thing at that time, I thought to myself, I, I can't do this. I visit people in the hospital and I found it very hard to receive anything from anybody because my life was, and I'm not making that as, oh, aren't you wonderful? No, no, no. It was just automatic. I was being paid for it, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> I would have done it anyway. But what I'm saying is it was a ministry and work and I was doing it and here I was. So again, enough said. I love you guys, everybody and anybody listening in, you know, uh, thank you so much and for the blessings uh, that we received. Eric and I, Eric is doing tip top as well right now. So where are we? Numbers. <clears throat> now, as we get going today, guys, we're going to finish out the book of Numbers, believe it or not. Don't panic. I'm going to skirt a lot of chapters. Numbers is a lot of repetition. I'm not going to go back over stuff, but I do want to just initially, as we start out today, uh, have a little run through Bring us to where we were very quickly as we left off back in chapter, where did we leave off? When we left off back in chapter 25, I think, last time. Numbers. Quick recap. Chapters 1 to 10. Well, you remember the children of Israel now, of course, they had escaped Egypt, didn't they? Got the heck out of there. We found the book of Genesis was all about, uh, about creation and new beginnings. The book of Exodus, redemption, deliverance from Egypt. The book of Leviticus, remember? Holiness, a holy people before God. How to be a holy people before God. We looked at that. Then we got to Numbers. What did we discover in Numbers was? Numbers was about the walk of the believer. Paul tells us, you know, these things are written as examples for us. As they cross the wilderness. This is a wilderness. This life journey is a wilderness. A struggle. And as we cross it, uh, we need his help. And we see how they face stuff. And then that we want that to speak to us. All the way through, by the way, guys, as we do the recap and as we get into numbers again today to close out the book. Please be aware and conscious, constantly, of the redemptive plan of God. It was you, Anne, that said at one time, love this study, you had never quite approached the Bible like that before. The complete link up with the Old and New Testament. You know, that really blessed me. Because that's wonderful. Because the redemptive plan of God is seen, Spurgeon says, on almost every page. On every page. 
So you want to be conscious and aware of the fact that these aren't just history and lessons and a class. This is the redemptive plan of God from day one. Jesus Christ, God sending his one and only son to die for us. Now Numbers, as I said, the walk of the believer, they had got out of Egypt, the exodus and everything. And don't you remember they came to Kadesh Barnea to enter the promised land and they sent in the 10 spies, do you remember? Uh, and uh, uh, 10, 12 spies and the, the, the timorous, what, what did we call them? The timorous 10 and the trusting two. Only Joshua and Caleb, the only two uh, that were believing which is telling us something, guys. Faith is so important, and that's important in this book as well. Truly believing, trusting that God can do anything. Well, they didn't, you know, and that whole generation died off. Remember, they, God told them they're not going to go into the promised land. Only ones are going to see it will be Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, and those who were believing. Faith is so important. We need to believe no matter what the circumstances say. No matter what's going on in our lives. The... They came after they left, uh, after they left, they came to Mount Sinai, after they spent 40 years <clears throat> wandering in the wilderness and they got to Mount Sinai. And the journey, the time they spent at Mount Sinai, if you're taking notes, was one year. One year before they began their journey back, their 40 year wilderness wanderings. But they spent a year at Mount Sinai. Uh, we learned also very quickly, try to get through this as quickly as I can to give you just the, without going too fast, that it'll be lost in translation. But I want you to know that, of course, again, the book of Numbers, you say, where did that come from, John Henry? What does Numbers, what's that all about? Well, Numbers, you know, the original word in the Hebrew, translated directly, means in the wilderness. In the wilderness. All right, where's Numbers come from, John Henry? Well, you know at the very first chapter of Numbers, there's a census taken. God tells them, take a census of the people. At the very end of the book of Numbers, or close to it, in chapter 26, God says, take another census. Why? Because the whole generation that lacked faith had to pass away, die, before the new generation, along with Moses and Caleb and, and Joshua, would go in. And so, <coughs> number them. Number them. So, well, but it means in the wilderness, in Hebrew, yeah. But there was a translation of the Hebrew into Greek. The language at the time of Jesus was Koine Greek. And uh, it was translated. And the word numbers in the wilderness, because of the census, because of the census in chapter 1 and chapter 26, numbers was called in Greek, translated from the Hebrew in the wilderness, numbers was called arithmoi, arithmoi, which in Greek means numbers, and from which we get our word arithmetic. So there you have the book of Numbers. <clears throat> now it was written, by the way, 1500 BC. And uh, let's see what else do I want to tell you about the first 10 chapters. They moved, now, when we got past the first 10 chapters and all of that, they settled in at Mount Sinai. Now after that, enter chapter 10, they're packing up and getting ready to leave Sinai to head to where? The promised land. They're about to enter the promised land. And God is preparing them to move out from Sinai in chapter 10. And then of course, you know, I want you to know how they moved. This is very important because there's a message in it for us. You had the camp set up in the very center of the camp, the tabernacle. What was that about? Where God met with man and man met with God. Boom, in the center. Who was all around it? The Levites. Why? Because they were the ones who were responsible for moving up, taking down, all of that. High priest, all that stuff. Levites. Right around. Then outside that, the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you remember the little chart we got, we got and everything? You got, I gave everybody, anybody didn't get one, let me know. And... The tribes all around with Judah at the head, right? Judah, Jesus came where? Tribe of Judah. So Judah leading all around. The Levites in the center taking care of everything. And eventually, of course, when the cloud would be there, they'd settle down. At night, the pillar of fire, sorry, the pillar of fire at night, 
cloud by day and they'd move. Remember the whole story? Remember that? Back all, along the way, yes, good. Now, guess what's happening in chapter 10? Clouds beginning to move. Children of Israel are moving. They're moving now as we're coming to our study today toward the promised land. Well, no, we dealt with a little bit more last time before we broke up. One thing, by the way, about the tabernacle in the center, the Levites, the children of Israel all the way around. God is saying to us, application, he wants to be in the center of our lives. I believe that's often a lot that's wrong. Certainly for me. So I ain't judging anybody, okay? At no time, by judging anybody or approaching it to somebody else, I, 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 a lot of my, my ministry is um, exhortation. K. Smith used to say that, John Henry, you, you and I are exhorters. Now, I'm, a, I'm not necessarily a classical analytical type teacher. Like Tad Smith, looks at everything from six different points of view and then highlights this and brings it out. He's got a brain like a machine. I don't know how he does it, but anyway. But I feel that the lot that has fallen to me in the vineyard is to take care of the anointing. You get it, guys. Don't we need to be doing this? Don't you think I'm telling you? It's telling me. I'm saying, don't we need? And so here, guys, God, at the very center of our life, he not always at the center of my life. When I'm angry and I'm bitter and I'm upset. But even at that, the busyness of life. Let's be conscious and more aware of Jesus being at the center of our lives. Chapter 10, cloud lifts. They're moving from Sinai. How long were they at Sinai? One year. <clears throat> and they're moving now. And they're moving away in the wilderness, heading towards the promised land. Chapter 11, complaining, moaning, blah, 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 blah. We looked at all of that. Big message out of this book, don't be a complainer, don't be a whiner, don't be a moaner. Be somebody praising God and thanking God. There was a sing song with our children when they were little back in, when we looked after the kids club in Fermoy and Care, along with taking care of the Presbyterian Church on a Sunday morning for the minister and taking the services there three times a week. He would come and do the communion on the fourth Sunday of the, or the fifth as it would be of the, of the month. And we took care of those people all through the years. It was such a blessing. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, where was I? Yeah, complaining and moaning. We used to sing with the children. Thank you, Lord. Do everything without complaining. It was a lovely old song, you know, and it's so important. Boy, I need to get that. I'm the chiefest at times. If something goes wrong, oh, what's going on now? Transparency is a good thing. And honestly, I'm not your pastor, so I can tell you straight up. You know, Ted Smith is a matter of he wants to tell you that or not. But, uh, you know, um, it's not easy, is it, guys? It doesn't matter whether you're a pastor or a elder or a deacon or an attendee or whatever, or a Christian. Now, not only were they complaining, but don't you know what Miriam and Aaron complained in their valley? So, brother and sister, have you a problem with family sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> it's around a long time. They're, they're really coming down on it, man. And they had all the repercussions of that. We can't go back over all that. I hope it refreshes your memory. That's all I want to do with this. And then, of course, you know, uh, they, get, they go on in chapters 13 to 19 to the wilderness of Paran, about halfway. And then they go in up to tw 22 to 36, where we're coming today. They get to the plains of Moab, right across from the promised land. I want you to put that in your brain right now. Plains of Moab, just across from the promised land, looking in at where? Jericho. We'll get into that later. Two spies, the only ones in Moses to get in because of their failure. Once again, very, very quickly, and then we're going to write into it very quickly. The redemptive plan of God all the way through. Where did we see it? We saw it in so many instances, didn't we? Do you remember when Moses, they were thirsty and they were complaining and God told him to speak to the rock, you know, and, uh, and everything. And Moses struck the rock, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Well, was that such a big deal? Because the rock is Jesus Christ and he was only struck once. Died once for all, Hebrews tells us. There's the link up. There's the Jesus in that story. And so he didn't get to go into the promised land because what? Lack of faith. Seems terrible, doesn't it? Well, yes, but no. God is making a point to show us faith is everything. Belief. Whatever is going on in your life today, believe. Trust, no matter what. <clears throat> anyway, again... Not only that, another case of Jesus, another redemptive plan of God. They're complaining again. That was part of the thing we went through as well. God told Moses, put a serpent up on a pole. Tell him anybody who looks at the serpent of the pole will be healed. Huh. 
Who did I tell you about? Jesus on the cross. You say, Jesus is a serpent on the cross? What did Jesus become for us? He became sin for us. He took all the sins of all the world upon himself. He was still God. He never gave up being God. But in that moment, when he said, Elo, Elo, Elama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, there was some kind of separation from the Godhead going on. Oh, well, why would that be? Because a holy God could not live in connection with sin. And in that moment, that was the greatest pain. Not Mel Gibson depicting nails in his feet and his hand. I saw people beaten badly in Northern Ireland. And I saw some scary things in my time. Inflicted pain by terrorists and people. Let me tell you something. That wasn't the greatest pain. The greatest pain was that moment of separation from the Godhead when he, when he hung on that cross and died for us. So brothers and sisters, I can't be going back over all that and I might be spending too much time. I hope I'm not. We did also come to the story of Balaam and Balak. They came to the plains of Moab and the, uh, 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 the, they came to the plains of Moab. Yes, they came to the plains of Moab and there was Balak, the king of the Moabites, uh, looking down and he said, well, ho, these Israelis are going to take over everything. So he called Balaam the prophet, a prophet of God, to curse him. Couldn't curse him, remember? Oh, the big story. And then he said to him, well, well ba yeah. <laughs> Balaam <coughs> was greedy. The way of Balaam, greed. Uh, doctrine of Balaam, subterfuge. A way of figuring, making something happen. In other words, he couldn't curse the children of Israel. God wouldn't let him. Balak wanted him to do so. And after trying several times, because he really wanted the money, because the way of Balaam was greed. Uh, actually, I made a little note there somewhere to refresh my memory and to remind me that, yeah, the way of Balaam, the error of Balaam, he didn't understand grace, the grace of God. You find that in Jude 11. The doctrine of Balaam, Revelation chapter 2, mixture with the world, idols and stuff, Revelation 2.14. And of course, you know, the way of Balaam, greed. The way of Balaam, greed, the error of Ga Balaam, the lack of grace, and the doctrine of Balaam, making it fit, making it work, manipulation. How do you do that? Oh, he said to the king, do you know what? I can't curse him for you, king, you know, I'm not able to do that, but I'll tell you what we can do. See those Midianite gals? Midianites are hanging out with the Moabites. Yeah. <laughs> we just get them. They're beautiful. Beautiful race of women. We'll get them to kind of mingle with them. Before long, they'll say, come, worship our gods. Sexual stuff and all that. Psh, took them way off. And so, subterfuge. A little ruse. A little happening whereby he made it happen so that he could get the money. And it was greedy. And that's what's going on with Mr. Balaam. But we'll see today what's going to happen to him. <clears throat> we dealt with all that. We went through all of that. And I came across something. I wrote this down. I found this fascinating. I'm just checking up on stuff again, you know, as you go through the Bible. The Midianites, by the way, these women that, that, that caused to take them off. Sin with these beautiful women. The Midianites were influenced by the Moabites. Who were the Moabites? And they were all living in the same area, all right? Because you're going to hear Moabites and Midianites. You're going, oh, which, which, which? The Moabites. Moab was a was the connection of Lot in the incestuous relationship with his daughter when he was drunk. And they said, we have nobody to keep the line going. Let's have sex with dad. Let's get him drunk. And the gals did. One night one, the other night the other. They had babies. One of those babies was Moab. And that's where the Moabites come from. Just so you know, that came into my brain as I was studying this time around. I don't think it did before. And now we're coming today. The second census, guys, you know. And um, <clears throat> we're coming to the end of the book of Numbers. And we're just going to glide over some of it today for time's sake. But also, too, so that you get the gist of it. And we'll stop at points where the redemptive plan We'll stop where I believe there's application for our lives. See what he's got to say to us. And hopefully then by the end, with this recap and having studied it, and done the book of Numbers and knowing this is the walk of the believer, 
we have come to a greater understanding of numbers than we ever had before, and it fit right in. Numbers chapter 26 today, and it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and Eleazar, the son of Aaron, <clears throat> the priest, saying, Take a census. Aha, here you go, second census. Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. From, four, from 20 years old and above, by their fathers' houses, all who are able to go to war in Israel. So this is what I told you about. Just write down second census. Why second census? Because the first one, back in chapter 1, well, don't you know, uh, the old generation have all died off. So now comes the second census. And they'll be numbered again. And these are the ones that are going in to take the land. Would you look down at chapter uh, 20? What did I say we were on chapter 26? Look down at verse 59. <coughs> and there you have a little history of Moses' family. You might often have wondered, where do we get the names for Moses' mother and father and his brothers and sisters? Right here, right here. In verse 59, Moses' mother's name was Jochebed, and uh, the father's name was Amram, and his brother's name was Aaron, and his sister's name was Miriam. All given to you, right here in the book of Numbers. 38 years later now, all the old generation passed away. <coughs> Moses, Caleb, Joshua, and the new generation poised and ready to enter the promised land. <clears throat> Chapter 27. <clears throat> Chapter 27. You can read the first seven verses. I'll be glancing over the first seven verses as I fill you in. I think it's the best thing to do with this rather than trying to go in detail over every aspect to give you just what's going on here. First of all, ladies, are you ready? Yes. This is a message for you because this is the women's lib chapter. <laughs> Now, I ain't kidding. Wait till you see what happens. You see here, uh, they say in this chapter, in these first verses, hey, it's not fair. We have equal rights. Our dad didn't have any son. And if you don't give us any land, then our father's name will die out. They come to Moses and they say, here's the story. Our dad didn't have any sons. It's just us girls. Now, you know, the problem we have with that is if you don't give us any land because we're not men, then our father's name will die out. Now, God is not anti-women. <laughs> and he's created us all equal. Now, I don't believe he's anti-women in any aspect, ministering, serving him, whatever. Scriptures like this show you God is fair. And, and, and we're all equal in the eyes of God. We have different roles to play. Different churches lay different emphasis on the particular roles, not going there. But ostensibly for all intents and purposes, ostensibly for all intents and purposes, very clearly here, God sides with the women. Because Moses says he goes to God and he says, well, what's going on here? These women are upset because they're saying, well, no sons and so the land, when we die, the land because there's no male, will all go, you know, be scattered. In Israel. So what did Moses say? And you can look down verse 5, I think. Moses said, well, let's take it before the Lord. I believe that's a word for somebody right now today. Is there something going on? You know, what the heck to make of it? They're struggling. There are difficulties. If you're like me, a lot of time, you take it before your dreams at night, thinking about it, trying to figure it out, and work it out, Maybe you should talk to a few people about it. Have some counseling. I'm not saying counseling is bad. I'm just saying the first port of call should be God. Or we take it to God in the last two and a half weeks. When I really believe this virus and I was so ill. I had no choice. <laughs> I made it real easy. I had nowhere to look except up. God, it was nobody could help. Couldn't he be in the company or be with anybody just in case I'd pass something on to him? So <clears throat> no one really did talk too much about it and really didn't want to because <laughs> I wasn't able to talk. Sorry, couldn't because for nearly a week, no voice. 
We need to take everything to God. I don't take half enough to him. I don't know about you. And especially, uno momento, por favor, especially when the rubber meets the road and something goes wrong. <sighs> Off, stage left. What am I going to do now? What's, what's this about? What's going? Take it to the Lord. Relax. Give it to him. He'll take care of it. I want, I, I, that, you, you just look at the scripture. He took it to the Lord. Everything. Oh, wasn't that what? I can't think of the words of it right now, but it began the lovely hymn written by a guy from Northern Ireland. Uh, there, there uh, you know, where he wrote to his mother and he was in Canada. What a friend we have in Jesus. Joseph Scriven. Thank you, Lord. Joseph Scriven from Banbridge Town in the County Down in Northern Ireland. In fact, I stood at the monument in the center of Banbridge with Tom Moore, a prison officer, and Robin Blakely, a Northern Irish policeman, and myself, cop. We stood in the square looking at that famous statue, monument to Joseph Scriven. Scriven, what a friend we have in Jesus. Everything, taking everything to the Lord in prayer. Yeah, everything that goes on. If you're like me, sometimes something happens and you don't pray. And then you pray about it. For God to cancel out what happened because you didn't pray. To get you back to the start line where you can now pray for God to maybe do the... You know what I'm saying? If we're being honest. It's easy to talk about it sitting here right now. Where we're all holes. Oh my goodness, imagine that. Imagine doing something like that. Whoa, what about when the rubber meets the road? When boom, it hits you in the right in the face. It's not easy. So don't be condemned. I've been a pastor for 30 something years and I'm going to tell you something. All the pastors I have known, even the ones that maybe came across, oh, the most super spiritual that were like, they talked even in hushed tones. And Jesus, and it's not me, it's the Lord. I've seen them all. <laughs> when the push comes to shove, baby, it ain't easy. And you only know it. You know, someone said you only really know the flavor of the, the tea bag only ex, ex, gives its flavor when you put it in hot water. That is when we really see who we are. Anyway. They won their case. That's why I said the women's whip chapter. God said, yes, absolutely. The gals can have land. Oh, marvelous. Then in chapter here, chapter 27, I'll do a Tad Smith on it. Chapter next. Number next. <laughs> I love that. Number next. Chapter next. Well, no. Chapter uh, 27. Continuing on here in chapter 27. 8 to 11 gives you, write this down beside it if you like, the laws of inheritance. This chapter gives you <coughs> the laws of inheritance. You want to write that down. Now, um, verse 12 of chapter 27. Let's read that. That's interesting. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, go up into this mountain of Abarim and see the land which I have given to the children of Israel. And when you have seen it, you will be gathered to your people. As Aaron, your brother, was gathered. For in the wilderness of Zin, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to hollow me at the waters before their eyes. These were the waters of Meribah at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Que pasa, Señor? Well, let me tell you. That's we, you know this. We just talked about it. He takes him up now to take a look in at the promised land. Oh, isn't that very nice? God's very gracious. He said, I'm going to take you up here. Come on up here. Come up Mount Aribim. Look over. Abarim. Look in. There it is. <coughs> but you're not going in. Why? Again, talked about not going into it again. Big lesson on what, really? What's the lesson on, though? The lesson is on lack of faith, yes, but the lesson is also on anger. He told him to speak to the rock, and he struck the rock. You rebels, must I get water for you? Must I get water for you? God said, you misrepresented me. Can I say this to everybody listening in in ministry? Yours truly included. Any of us in ministry, whatever. And we're all in ministry to some extent, right? Because we're serving the Lord. Be careful you don't misrepresent God. I have to be really careful doing this study. Because it's so easy when you talk a lot. You could say something. But I think we all have to be really... Now, I do believe the Lord gives his protection and anointing and I'm not fretting or whatever because I know he's with me. 
But for all of us, whatever we say, you know, sometimes you can say, you know, and I've heard people say this all through my life in ministry. Well, God told me, and I believe God. You want to drink your head off or take drugs? God says it's okay um, as long as it's legal and as long as you... I don't think you should do this, these other things at all, at all, at all, ever. Well, if there's a clear line in the Bible where it says no, yes, I would agree with that. But sometimes we make statements, don't we? Like we think we know. Let that never be outside the parameters of God's word. Because we're in dangerous territory if we do. Because we would misrepresent God and, and, and God not happy with being misrepresented. Anyway. He doesn't get to go in. And then verse 15. Moses spoke to the Lord saying, Let the Lord the God of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them and who may lead them out and bring them in that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. I tell you, all I get from this is I hope you do too, and if not, maybe I can alert you to it right now. And that is the very good news that you look at a guy like Moses and that God would give us that blessing, that we would be like him. He doesn't say, what, I can't get in? Oh, because I did that, I was so unfair, and I've been trying so hard, and look how hard I've been ministering, and I've been giving it my all, and I've been... Duh, 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 duh. No, you just accept it. He just accepts it. And what does he do? He asks for his people, for God's people. He's more interested in them than he is in himself. I put it today a lot of ministry and a lot of servants of the Lord. You know it because sometimes you see down the course of life how they can go way out there and be away from the Lord or do something terrible. Because ministry can very often be about the man. And can I tell you, that's something we have to be real careful of. Whether we are Baptists, whether we are Presbyterians, whether we are Anglicans, whatever religion, whether we are non-denominational Calvary Chapelites uh, of a time, we've got to be really careful, you know. I think that there's, that, 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 that there's a huge lesson in this for us. That is, it's not about the man. When Gary and became an Anglican priest, he's now, but keep him in prayer, he's one more year of law to do. He went back to do his law degree, he finished his law degree in Pepperdine in Malibu, California. And he's doing real well. But he's an Anglican priest with Duke Divinity and all that, probably, I don't know if that was a great help to him or not. But anyway, he got his masters out at Duke and everything like that. And he's a smart fella and everything uh, like that, you know. But I remember going to the Anglican church uh, at first when he was a priest and I was sitting there and I thought, oh, all these robes and things. And I was a bit critical, you know. I mean, uh, and I thought, all these robes and things and the liturgy. Mind you, I've come to love the liturgy in many ways. The liturgy has got a lot going for it, you know. It's another way. Let's put it that way. It's another way to approach God and I, I really came to love it but particularly the robes and things when then I flew back after our time there was about 12 bishops and priests and everything all of the Anglican church all there ordaining Gary and his hair down to here and great character and they all loved him I was still sitting there looking up couldn't believe that Gary you know was doing all this and but you know what I came to understand something I came back to Calvary Chapel. Now, this is not bashing any church, including Calvary Chapel, by the way. But I saw some of these guys, you know, and, 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 and in California, the pastors of some churches, independent churches, and they were really dressed, not dressed to the nines as in like fancy, but all the in gear, you know, and the tight jeans and the hair all brushed back one way and a little bit flick, 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 flick the other way. And all, you know, maybe with the shirt, with the right emblem or the something, or the crocodile or the whatever, <laughs> living. 
South Carolina, they'd never wear one with an alligator. <laughs> might not be safe, you might attract them. But I looked at this and I thought to myself, do you know what? Those Anglican people with their robes are drawing no attention to themselves at all. They all look boring, they all look the same. <laughs> and I was actually able to spiritually focus on the Lord sitting in that Anglican church. God told me, John Henry, it's not important what you wear or don't wear. We, what's important is in here. And I get that, Lord. Thank you. But what are you saying, John Henry? Are you thought about becoming an Anglican? No. But I, for the first time in my life, saw something very clearly. It's about God's children and all of us worshipping the Lord, not judging and being critical and Presbyterians, Anglicans, Catholics, Medicine, Methodists, you know, non-denominational churches. Hey, Do you know what Chuck Smith used to say? Thank you, Lord, for bringing that back into my brain. Chuck used to say, do you know what? And he's a man who touched the world for Christ. And he was pure, I'll tell you, I knew him. He used to say, the more spiritual a person becomes, the less their denominational focus. It doesn't mean they don't belong to a denomination, they'll be a little uh, heartfelt Baptist, of course, or whatever. But that's not the focus. The focus is Jesus. I'm spending too long. But I do think that's important. Moses was interested in the people, uh, not in himself. God help us all. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 18 of chapter 27, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim and the Thummim, I take it, at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, he and all the children of Israel with him, and all the congregation. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua, and he set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation. Guys, very quickly, very exciting. Joshua is entering the scene here. I mean, I love him. We get to the book of Joshua. I can't wait. I just love the story of Joshua. And I tell you right now, as you know, at the end of his life, in those latter years, of course, for 30 years I worked with him, but at the end of his life, I became Chuck Smith's personal assistant. I told you that Gary fed into AI down in Mexico when he was down there visiting a girlfriend, and he got something back that said, he put in who was Chuck Smith's personal assistant, and it said John Henry Corker, and I was blown away. Even if it is AI, I don't understand all that stuff anyway, right? But the interesting thing was, you say, oh, John Henry, you're blowing, are you? No, 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 I wasn't like running the show. I wasn't like one of the big dogs who were there arranging the organization of the church, like the board members and the elders. I, I, no, that wasn't my role. I, I was an assistant pastor to him, but I was like his valet. I took care of all of his personal needs and jobs and things he needed done. I was with him six days a week and six nights a week. Up to the day he died, and with him on the night he died. And I remember saying to him one time, you know something, Chuck? He said, what is it, John? I said to a friend, another pastor, he said something about your relationship with Chuck Smith, and I said, yes, I'm his valet, you know. And he said, don't you ever say that, John Henry. I said, why? You're much more than a valet. <laughs> valet? You, you know, you're undermining yourself. and everything. Don't be saying stuff like that, you know. Just, you say, oh, I'm not a teacher, I'm an exhorter, you know. Come on. So I don't know, I'm being honest. This is what I, I feel, I, you know. I'm, I'm his valet. So I went to Chuck that evening and I told Chuck, I said, you know, Chuck, uh, ho, ho. and so I said to this fellow, I was your valet. So I am really, right? And he said, oh, you bet, John. I said, you need to talk, talk, I shouldn't be saying that because I was sort of more than that. And Chuck said, more than that, John? Well, you know then that would have you as more than Joshua. So what? Uh, do you know what the word, the original language word actually means? Joshua as his assistant, his valet. It says nothing about him running the organization. It says nothing about him doing the books. It says nothing of him being the chief advisor. He just took care of all of Moses' needs. And John, I said, yes, sir, that's what you do for me. Thank you. I said, wow, 
Thank you, boss. He said, good, good. Now, he didn't very often give compliments. Let me tell you. I should have got that one in print. <laughs> he didn't very often. In fact, he wouldn't ever. I'd speak for him. I spoke for him almost every Wednesday night. He was out of town. Went out to hundreds of thousands of people. No kidding. Glory to God. I mean, it wasn't me. I was in his pulpit, so don't get me wrong. But he asked me to do it. Odd Sunday when he was out of town. Most Wednesday nights. He had somebody on Sunday nights. He was away. But the story is, you know, I look back and I think to myself, God, you're so good. I said to Hillary that one of the first nights I ever spoke for Chuck Smith in a pulpit that touched the world. And he got me letters from all over the world. And I said to Hillary, I believe this. He must, he's made a huge mistake, you know. You see that guy over there? He went to Gordon Conway Thomas Rogers uh, University. He went to Gordon Conway or some big famous university. This guy went to Columbia. And this guy, do you know that so-and-so could converse with you in Koine Greek? No problem. I don't even know how to spell some of these words. And I'm standing in for him. And Hillary looked at me and she said to me, <laughs> what are you teaching on tonight? Oh, I said, the grace of God. She said, there you go. It's God's grace. Not your ability, your lack of ability, or who you are, or who you're not. It's God's choice. And he is anointed and ordained. And so we went on many times. I would look at him and I would say to Chuck, you know, Chuck, little did we know when we met that first time back in 1990, Little did we know, and he would say to me, absolutely, John, what God would do and what God had done and how I was able to be there for him, helping him in the last days of his life. Anyway, a little bit of reminiscing about Chuck there. But I think it's probably the greatest title I was ever in my whole life, and that is that I was his valet. And I want nothing more than that. It meant the world to me and for this guy. Now, oh, listen, Joshua. What's the difference between Joshua and Moses? Very quickly. You can read all this in your own time. But now you'll have the gist of it. You'll have the feel for it. Let me tell you the, di the difference was Moses spoke directly to God and heard directly from God. Joshua wasn't quite on that level. Why? Read the scripture. We just read it. And go back over in your own time. Eleazar, he had to go through the priest. What did the priest do? It says the Urim there. The Urim and the Thummim. What were those things again? Black and white stone. Some say. We don't know. That might, be, might not be so. But it was a way of getting God's mind on certain things, the, the Urim and the Thummim. So Joshua had to go to Moses. I uh, had to go to Eleazar. Sorry, Moses is going to be gone. To hear from him wasn't hearing directly from God. But what have I got to say that's amazing about Joshua? <clears throat> that we all want today. And you want to really mark this down because if you get nothing else today, I don't care whether we are Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist, whatever we are, Methodist, whatever we are, whatever you are, whatever is going on. Here's what we need more than anything else. It's something Joshua had that sets him out there, sets him apart. And you'll see it when we get to the book of Joshua. What is that, John Henry? Would you look at verse 18? <clears throat> Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, God told Moses, a man in whom is the Spirit. You and I encounter people every day of the week. We encounter all the different denominations we just talked about. We encounter other Christians. What's the most important thing of all? Is the spirit here. And again, quoting Chuck Smith. It's not, do you have the Holy Spirit? It's more, does the Holy Spirit have you? Because I find a lot of people can talk about the Holy Spirit. Oh, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit. I walk in the Spirit with His help and His grace. Does the Spirit have me? How do I know? How do you know if you're a servant? I'll tell you how. How do you react when you're treated like one? How do you know you're a real believer? When the rubber meets the road. When situations and things arise. Somebody says something. Strike back. Unforgiving. Bitter. Can't let go of it. Hurt me. I'm hurt. I, 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 I. Greg Laurie said once. Cross out the eye. And see the cross. 
we need to be looking to the cross. And we need to cross out that eye and have the Spirit of God moving in us. And the Spirit of God is love. By the way, when you say love, joy, peace, goodness, kind, no, wait, 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 wait. The Spirit of joy is love. Mm -hmm. Ian Bounds, Civil War Chaplain, Lafayette, Richmond Brigade. Great book on prayer. He said, help me, Lord. Joy is love's consciousness. So when you get the fruit of the Spirit, you're talking about love. What's the consciousness of it or the awareness of it? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of these things are evidence. So if you want to say today, well, John Henry was saying, and I was thinking about it myself as I was reading it, do I have the Spirit? Has the Spirit got me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Wait, wait, wait. wait. When the rubber meets the road, how am I? When push comes to shove. So anyway, chapter 28, guys, got to move on. <clears throat> Write this down, would you? Chapters 28 and 29. Reiteration. Reiteration of the sacrificial system. Reinforcing, reiterating, reestablishing what God had given them earlier. Write down here beside chapter 28 and 29. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. We dealt with it all in Leviticus 23. The reiteration here. Going back over it again. The entire sacrificial system. We're not going back over it again in your own time. <clears throat> Chapter 29. We ain't deliberating long on either. Let me get the opening verse. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. Seventh day on the first day of the month. Oh, the seventh month on the first day of the month. <coughs> What's this about? Uh, again, time's sake today, and it's racing on, so hold on tight. Fasten your seat belts and hold on to your helmet straps. Tighten them up because we are going to bring this thing in shortly. This chapter 29, verse 1, in the seventh month. What was the seventh month? What's that about? Well, the seventh month, October. And there's a special festival. It's not October Fest. Now, by the way, if anybody knows anything about that, don't dwell on that now, please. I want you to focus on Oktoberfest. Here is the festival that takes place in the Bible in October. The 10th day of the 7th month. What day would that be, I wonder? Yom Kippur. 10th day of the 7th month, Yom Kippur. And what happened on Yom Kippur? That one day in the year was the year that the priest would go into, not just the holy place. Remember this? All the, all the handouts we gave out here, the pictures we had on the screen. The priest, the high priest, only the high priest would go from the holy place into the holy of holies through the temple curtain through the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies he would go into the holy of holies and he would meet with god and he would present the sins of the people and offer all the sacrifices to the lord for the sins of the people and then he would come out having taken their stuff to god he come out with whatever god said to him for them once a year he'd do it several times in and out now on that day because there were different sacrifices had to be taken place told you that all the way through, even though we're not reading back over all of this, we want to see the redemptive plan of God. Where do you see the redemptive plan of God? Easy. High priest, one day in the year, go in, meet with God in a special way, and bring the sins before the Lord and have them all cleansed and washed and taken care of. And uh, do you know how many animals he sacrificed on that day? Write this down, 34, many of the commentators, 34 at least sacrifices on Yom Kippur. And guess what? He did it all alone. Now, I knew trained butchers back in Ireland. And a friend of mine one time had a big butcher shop. And he had an alcoholic. He had a problem with alcohol and he was put off the road. And so he asked me, you know, it was the time when I lost all my businesses and I was out of work and I was reading the Bible. He came to some meetings with me. He was actually stabbed to death later in a gang-related incident in the city of Limerick for gambling and terribly painful. That just came back into my mind. Oh. And uh, he was, he was killed, he was murdered. And uh, 
24 miles down the road from where we lived and where he had a fabulous butcher shop. But I used to go during that time for him out to the, I, there's a name for it, isn't it, where they kill the animals? I can't think of the name of it. Yeah. I'd go out there and this guy, he was bit like a tank and I always remember he had a kind of one of these church sleeves cut off and everything, bit like a mountain, geez, like, a, like a rock. And he was killing the animals, you know. Well, I didn't know, I, but I got there one day, I got there early, I need a few more to do, you know, and I'll tell you, I never wanted to go again. <laughs> and the thing where the big hammer thing would come out and hit the cow and kill him, and oh, it's terrible. And then he's cutting them up like, like, like lightning. But it did do something for me, because years later in Bible study, I thought to myself, wow, killing an animal, no matter what way you kill him, this is a very quick and humane way to do it. <laughs> but then having to cut him open and take out, a oh, big, big deal. 34 animals. He was busy on Yom Kippur. Now, who helped him? Nobody. He did it all alone. Redemptive plan. God, that to take all the sins away. The children of Israel. All pointing to what? Jesus Christ. Once and for all. Sacrifice. Take all our sins away. Who helped him? Nobody. Did it alone on the cross. So if you get nothing else from chapter 29 on Yom Kippur, mark that down. And then in verse 12, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Feast of Tabernacles, when they had those little booths built that they went out into the wilderness and they remembered <clears throat> how they had been in the wilderness and this, they could do this so their children could see it and ask, what's this all about? These are the years we spent in the wilderness. Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> and we dealt with all of that back in Leviticus as well. Chapter 30. Would you write, write down at the top of chapter 30 there today, vows. V-O-W-S. Vows. Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Ecclesiastes 5. This is very important, guys. Ecclesiastes 5, 5, 5, 5. Ecclesiastes says, Better not to vow at all, than to make a vow and break it. Now, only a moment, because we're going to move on. Time's moving. I want to share with you something. We've got to be very careful. I swear, honest to God, I promise, I guarantee, I will do. Better make no promise at all. Listen to what <clears throat> Deuteronomy 23.21 if you make, listen, listen carefully. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you and you will be guilty of sin. That's a word for all of us. Don't make any vows at all. Jesus said, don't swear at all by heaven, uh, by God's throne. Don't swear by the earth. If, uh, you know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So important. First, chapter 31, Moses' final act here. He's ordered from, by God to destroy the Midianites. Who are the Midianites again, John Henry? Do you remember? The Moabites and the Midianites. And Moab, the descendant of Lot and his daughter, incestuous, drunken behavior. Midianites linked up with the Moabites. And Balak was the one who said, Balaam was the one who said to Balak, those Midianite women are beautiful. You want the children of Israel to sin, and I can't curse them, but I'll tell you what, you know what, maybe we can uh -huh, put them together. And when they see these beautiful gals, oh boy, they'll take them off and, 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 and worship their gods, sexual Venus, Ashtaroth, Baal, Moloch, Aphrodite, and surely they did. And they sinned. Now come to judgment. Verse 1, chapter 31. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites. Ah, these guys, these gals. For the children of Israel, afterwards you shall be gathered to your people. So now you know why the vengeance is needed to be taken on the Midianites. Because these were the girls, the gals, the let them astray. So Moses spoke, verse 3, to the people saying, Arm some of yourselves for war and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for the Lord on Midian. Verse 7. 
and they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded <coughs> and uh, commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. There they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Hey, mark this, will you? The son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. The, 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 the five, sorry, they killed these kings, the five kings of Midian, and Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Balaam at one stage when he was trying to avoid cursing the children of Israel, he said, go away from me, let me die the death of the righteous. He died the death of the unrighteous. I'm not going to deliberate over it, not just because I'm in ministry and I've been a pastor for 30 years, but there's a strong warning for folk who are in ministry. Right here, Balaam was a prophet of God. And greed took him down. A lot of that in our world today. Now, I don't know. We've got a lot of TV ministries and stuff like that. I'm not going to judge anybody. I, I, God has spoken to my heart. Don't worry. Stop judging, Johnny. Okay, Lord. Enough of that all your life. Yes, I'm sorry. But you know what? People with ministries, and they're living like kings, you know. Several airplanes, big houses, money, clothes, jewelry. It's just it's so far, isn't it, from Christ? This is why, like, like I said about, you know, some churches where it's just, the focus is just on Christ. That's what we need. Simple. And again here, I, I, I won't deliver it because I did talk about that, so I won't go back over it, guys. Just simply here, moving along now, and seeing that these Midianites are going to be wiped out and everything. And let's see, we've got to move on. Verse 9, the children of Israel took the women of Midian captive. So they killed the guys, but they took the women captive. The beautiful women. Aha, what's going on? With their little ones, and they took the spoil and the cattle and all their flocks and all their goods, and they burned with fire the cities that they dwelt and all the forts, and they took all the spoil and the booty, man and beast, and then they brought them as captives and the booty of the spoil to Moses, to Eliezer, the priest. And remember, they wanted Mo that, that, that Aaron would be, that Joshua would be going to now for advice, for direction from God, and to the congregation of the children of Israel, the camp in the plains of Moab. We're the plains of Moab now, looking right in on the promised land. By the Jordan, there you have it, look, by the, across from Jericho, could it be more plain? And Moses and Eliezer, the priests, and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet with them outside the camp. But Moses was angry with the others, with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds who had come from the battle. And Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident at of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Again, Balaam's greed, these Midianite women were used. God told him to destroy the Midianites. They went in and destroyed the Midianites, but he kept all the beautiful gals alive, and their children, maybe some of their own children, kept them alive, and God was angry. You know, very quickly, haven't time, two sentences, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Something that 9-11 happens. Something like October in Israel this past year happens. If we're not angry about that, that's sin. We need to stand firm and strong against evil. Right? Somebody molests, murders, kills, rapes. We've got to be angry. But not hating the person, but hating the sin. And very clearly here, this is a righteous anger. There's a, there's a topical message in that for righteous anger, but not for right now. Therefore, verse 17, kill all the males among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man intimately. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. Now, very quickly in this, whenever you see wipe out, destroy, kill them all, boom, 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 boom. Oh, terrible, 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 terrible. Remember again, won't you, that very clearly we're told by Paul, all these things are written as examples for us. And when he's talking in the Old Testament about killing all this, wipe them out, every man, jack of them, all of them completely, men, women and children, animals and all, like the famous uh, word that uh, 
was given to Saul to destroy the Amalekites, all of them, every single one. What it really is saying is that we need to destroy and put to death the flesh nature. Everything that's not of God. Separate from it completely. Don't leave a sting in the tail. Now, maybe there's somebody listening right now. Maybe there's somebody here right now, any one of us, and there's some sting in the tail. Maybe it's somebody who's into pornography and now they're just dabbling around a little bit with what's on the immediate internet or on the, you know, Fox or all of these channels that are on the phone and pictures come up and it's not really pornography. But if you leave a sting in the tail, it can come right back and devour you. For me, it wasn't so much pornography, thank God, but I did have anger. Oh, I know you'd never believe that. Would you excuse me while I polish my halo? Fierce anger. Fierce anger. Nationalistic type anger. In a, in a not right way. And I look back on all of that in my life in Ireland and I think, wow. Now I see the sting in the tail. Somebody says something to me or gets me angry. I'm telling you one thing. I'm dead to sin, but sin isn't dead to me. It rises up within me. <clears throat> I can actually feel it and I go, no. You have to make a conscious decision and say, whatever it is for you, if it is lust, if it is anger, if it is bitterness, unforgiveness, if it is gossip, if it is slut, whatever it is, say no. I'm not going there. I was bought and paid for by a price on Calvary's cross. Satan, go directly to Jesus and do as he tells you. I'm a child of God, bought and paid for by a price on Calvary's cross. You have no hold over me. Go in Jesus' name. I believe we don't do that half often enough. And that would be having the spirit in us, standing against it. So a quick word for somebody there. We're getting close to the end, guys. Hold on. So at any rate here now, we see, where was I? Let me know. There's the, there's, there's the, um, these gals were all to be, to, were all to be wiped out as well. Every single bit of it taken care of. Um, in, in other words, what he's saying here, I think, is this an interesting thing here. I made a comment on it. Something struck me. Yeah, 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 here it is. Don't bring evil into the camp of your life. That's what I scribbled here in my old notes. Don't bring evil. Where are you walking? Walk in the light. Walk in the word of God. Walk in fellowship with Christ. Be in fellowship. Be in the fellowship of believers. You're the salt of the earth. You're to be the salt of the earth. You're to be the light of the world. You're to be the salt of the earth. You're to be different. And uh, don't bring evil into the camp. I have to develop one thought here very quickly because it just came up and... It struck me, it was actually on the airplane, Jim, that I thought of it. And it is something that needs, we, we talked about it, and it, I, I'd just like to address it in case that anybody else might have ever had that kind of, I think we, 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 we dealt with it when we were chatting, Jim, you and I. But Jim did come to me with a question, and, and it was only on the airplane when I was studying this, that it lit up for me, and I thought, hmm. And it was like further to what we were saying in the final week here. And that is that, don't bring sin into the camp. Keep it out. All right. So Jim's question was one of, you know, Calvary Chapel Chuck Smith would have said that he allowed all the hippies to come in off the beaches and they poured into the churches and half of them half clothed and everything and they came in. And I have said in Marin County when I pastored there, where gay people came to the church and I allowed them in and some people left. Now, so the question was, what happens, you know, if, if, if these people come in? And I get it. I get why, why you'd let them in. But don't we have to be separate from the world? Don't we, have to be, don't, we have to, don't we have to separate ourselves, keep away from all appearance of evil? And if you bring all these people in, if you allowed all these people to come in and all the fellowship and hang out and everything, couldn't they influence them? What about my grandchildren? If they're there and they say this kind of thing, surely they'd be influenced by it. Not just the gay people in Marin County, all the hippies and everything, all the plethora of people that came with them. Yeah. The important thing to get here, though, is with regard to both my stand in Marin and Chuck Smith's stand, it was not fellowship. These people are not brought in. Be part of us. If they came in and wanted to know where they, we don't, in other words, <clears throat> we don't shut the door on anyone. Jesus didn't shut the door on Mary Magdalene. But Mary Magdalene wasn't coming into Jesus' company and in with the disciples and the apostles. And, 
and sleeping with half of them or carrying on in our old way of life. Now I can testify to the fact that in answer to the question that there were, there were none of them were acting out. I saw them through the generations because I came even later after the first 10, 15, 20 years. And there weren't people in there for a start, they wouldn't stay because Chuck proclaimed the word of God absolutely directly. And if there were people, absolutely 100%, they'd be addressed and told, you know, if you want to have fellowship, you have to know Christ and enter into this agreement. They were not allowed to come in willy-nilly. It's a good question. They're not allowed to come in willy-nilly and interact with everybody and our grandchildren and everything and they're living in a strange lifestyle or behaving in a terrible way. That would be terrible. The gay people that came to Marin very quickly to qualify, they came out of a structure in, in San Francisco where there was a home where they had a Sunday morning service. There were people who came out of the gay lifestyle and they wanted to be walking right with the Lord. They didn't have any service on a Sunday night, so they'd come to Calvary Chapel. I allowed them in. They came in threes, three men or three women. So there was always one protection in case and we were working with them out of the group of about 10 or 15 I think there was about two maybe three that remained on in the church as solid Christians with us till the day I left ministry there so very quickly kind of move on can't deliberate longer over it but I think it is really important because we could sort of say well everybody let them all come in no no oh help me lord can two walk together unless they be agreed? What fellowship could the light have with the darkness? We are to shun all appearance of evil. Absolutely. And more scriptures. They actually, funny thing is, sit in the airplane and all these scriptures that are coming into my head. I didn't write them down. So I gave me once I can remember. So absolutely. We need to shun all appearance of evil. We don't give carte blanche to people as, come in, no matter. So I hope that that makes that even further abundantly clear. It certainly was the Lord speaking to my heart on it, because I never quite thought of it before. And I did think that you could kind of give the impression that they were allowed all to come in. Now, not everybody would get that, but some, some might. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I hope that would, would help you. You know, we don't give freedom or carte blanche to everybody to just wander in willy-nilly. Moving right along. Oh, boy, our time is up. Didn't mean to deliberate there, but it just came back into my mind when I read that scripture. The remainder of this chapter, guys, Moses tells them to give some of the spoils to God. I'm not going to get into it, but the end of this chapter is all about giving to God and giving the spoils. Whatever we get, we give the off the top the best. Is that 10%? You know, some of the greatest tithers ever like Colgate and Wrigley and... Oh, there's like Procter and Gamble were supposed to be. I, I don't know. But they gave everything in the end. They were given everything. But again, always remember. What kind of giving did Jesus notice? The widow who had nothing. She gave up her very sustenance. She wasn't getting a tax relief. She wasn't getting nothing. She was giving of her very... Now, it doesn't mean if you tithe and you're giving and it's tax benefit, that's wonderful. That's a great way to bless the children of God. But sometimes... When we give, when it hurts, when we give in such a way, she gave of her very sustenance and he acknowledged it. Now in chapter 32, guys, I'm just going to tell you the story. Reuben and Gad. Let's read the first couple of verses and then I'll tell you the story. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, in the re indeed the, the land was great for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses and Eliezer the priest and the leaders of the congregation saying, now, okay, uh, Reuben and Gad, you ready? <clears throat> Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. Oh, I haven't got long to go, so bear with me. The last chapter is just going to fly. Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh he came to Moses and said, hey, Mo, what's it, fuzz? <laughs> we really love the land here on this side of the Jordan. It's perfect for cattle. You go ahead and take whatever you want in the promised land. We're real happy with this land here. Moses said, what in tarnation is wrong with you guys? Don't you realize that we spent 40 years in the wilderness wandering because of this kind of thing? You want, you want to subject the people to that again or wipe us out completely? God will be done with us? 
We're going in there to fight and take that land. You want to sit back and nice and pretty here? So they came to Moses. You can read in your own time. I haven't got time. You can read in your own time. They came to Moses and they said to Moses, tell you what, Moses, here's what we'll do. We will arm our tribes for battle and we'll go down and fight with you. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll conquer the promised land. With, in other words, we'll go in and we'll conquer the land with you and we'll take all the land along with you, our men, Reuben, Gad, half tribe of Manasseh, all our men will fight, take the land. But when the land is taken, we'll come back here and take a residence back here. So we'll have participated fully. <coughs> so Moses said, okay. Uh, but he said, you know what? All right. Okay. But if you don't do what you've said, be sure your sin will find you out. Now, quickly, haven't time to develop it. Be sure your sin will find you out. Would you look at that in verse, 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 verse 23. Have you sinned today? Hmm? Bring it to God. Is there something you said you would do and you didn't do? Fulfill it. Don't make a vow. Remember, not good to make vows and not fulfill them. And be sure, because the chickens come home to roost, it'll come back and bite you. Don't leave a sting in the tail. Chapter 33, 50 verses here. They're moving from one place to another. It's a long, tedious, laborious list of names. The journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And it gives you all the list of names in your own time. But he does say down at verse uh, 50, down at verse 50, he says, uh, speak to the children of Israel, 51. When you enter the land, drive out the inhabitants, destroy their engraved stones, destroy all their images and demolish all their high places. Again here, we have dealt with this many times before. When you go in and take over the land, destroy all the images. Let me tell you this again, very, very quickly. Those images are with us today. I quoted them earlier. Moloch, some say the God of pleasure. It's not exactly clear and defined in the Bible, but why not? Baal or Baal, the God of the intellect. Boy, is that ever in the world today. Mm. Venus, sexual love. Woo! Ashtaroth, again, sensuality. Mammon, money. Bacchus, booze. All the stuff that, you know, the Bible in Ezekiel, where is it in Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 8, I think, where he speaks of chambers of imagery, the mind. These gods are in the mind. And I'll tell you what triggers these gods. Ezekiel 8, thank you, Lord. It says chambers of imagery that are in the minds of men. Guys, listen, these exist in our minds and they're triggered. Devil knows it. They're triggered by stuff we see and hear in our world today. And we need to have no truck with that and put it out. That's what he's saying to the children of Israel taking the promised land. If he's calling us to do the same. Again here, again we've dealt with that many, many times before. I'm not going to deliberate over. Chapter 34, almost there. Boundaries of the land given in chapter 34. Say, John Henry, are you going to expand on that? No. Do you know why? Open up your Bible maps at the back of your Bible in your own time. And you'll see the boundaries of the land. Ephraim... Uh, Manasseh, all the different tribes, Reuben, Gad, Asher, they're all there in one of those pages. And to me, that makes it an awful lot easier than talking about it. Just look at the map and you'll see the boundaries of the land are given in chapter 34. In chapter 35, <clears throat> again, I'm going to just sum it up for you. I wanted to finish this today, move on to Deuteronomy next time. And we'll be slowing down, I promise, next week. I just wanted to wrap this up. So thank you for uh, indulging me that we can do this because now we can move on. We've missed so many weeks. Cities of Refuge, chapter 35, established. <clears throat> what are the cities of refuge, John Henry? Read it in your own time, I'm going to tell you. If a man murdered somebody back in that day, <clears throat> you know, he, 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 the family were in duty bound to kill him for doing it, right? But what about if you were swinging your axe around chopping wood and the axe head flew off and hit a fellow on the head and killed him? If you killed somebody accidentally, the cities of refuge were set up that you could... Go to the city of refuge. Go in there and until the high priest or whatever died, you'd be safe in the city of refuge. Okay? Oh, that's good. So that's why they had these cities of refuge. Nice. And you'd be safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How would you not be safe? If you left the city of refuge, the family could get you. Oh, what's that got to do with me today, John Henry? Because the Bible teaches us very clearly that God is our city of refuge. In fact, the Bible says he is our rock our shield, our high tower, and Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 618, he is our city of refuge. 
Okay, redemptive plan of God again, remember? What do you do? You have sinned. Run to Jesus. And when you're in Christ, you're secure. If you leave Christ, Christ isn't then going to, you know, God isn't going to punish you, but you remove yourself from the place of his blessing. And you're endangered. That's why we do not want to be in any appearance of evil or getting, we want to be turning away from all of that because we're leaving ourselves open for the attack of the enemy if we're not in Christ. So cities of refuge all given to us here in this chapter, in chapter 35, but we're just about there, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I'm not going to develop that any further. You can look it up in your own time, read it through in your own time. It's all there. Chapter 36, our final chapter today. The chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, son of Manasseh, the family of the sons of Joseph, came and spoke before Moses and the leaders of the chiefs of the fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord Moses to give the land as an inheritance to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of our brother Zalafahad to his daughters. Mm. What's this about John Henry? Very quickly. Again, I'm just going to tell the story and we'll wrap it up. Do you remember earlier, in the chapter earlier, I think it was chapter, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 27, where the gals came and said, well, what if the brothers, if, if there's no sons, and then we don't, the land will disappear, and we need to get the land, it needs to be our land. What's going on here in this chapter? I'll tell you. You ready? You can read in your own time. The gals say to Moses, there's a, or no, the, 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 the other tribe, the tribes, they, they, they say, the problem is, but these gals get the land. Okay. You got that? But what happens then, you know, if they marry somebody from another tribe? Does all that land now go to the other tribe? Doesn't seem fair. Our, our, our family will again die out. Because it all goes to the other tribe. You got that? How does God solve the problem? God says, okay, I'm on it. I hear you. More women's lip stuff going on here. God says, I'm on it. I'll tell you what you do. Tell them. They can only marry within the tribe. So that way they couldn't go off, marry somebody else in another tribe, and all the children belong to that tribe. They had to marry within the tribe. You can read this to your heart, content. We haven't time today, but that's exactly what's going on here. Verse 13. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab across from, uh, by, by the Jordan across from Jericho. Give me one and a half minutes, two minutes. We're going to close this. I'm going to tell you. Here's the deal. We've come to the end of the book of Numbers. Now, brothers and sisters, where are they? They're on the other side of the Jordan. They're looking over at Jericho. You know, the book of Joshua, all about Jericho. And then Ai. They did real well at Jericho. Because they were sitting in the camp, they failed at Ai. That whole story is about to happen in the book of Joshua. It's terribly, terribly exciting. Now, the handover, you really, the public ministry, if you like, of, 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 of Moses is concluded here in the book of Numbers, but Deuteronomy will continue with his private ministry. A brief recap. This book of Numbers, 39 chapters in the wilderness now, poised to enter the promised land, ready to go in and take the promised land right at the border. What have we learned in the book of Numbers? Very quickly. Unbelief is disastrous. Faith is everything. Not to long for the sins of the past or the stuff of the past. Not to be griping, complaining and whining and murmuring. And stay away from all forms of compromise. These are some of the things we learned as we went through. And again, <clears throat> next week, <clears throat> we're coming to Deuteronomy. 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 Deuter second. Anomy. Law. The second telling of the law. Now, please. I want you to get this, just at the close, so we'll be ready for next week. You would think now that you would go on from Numbers into Deuteronomy, and you're on the border about to enter the Promised Land, you're coming up to Jericho, as you cross the Jordan, and that's where we're going to go next week when we get into Deuteronomy. No. Deuteronomy is a second telling of the law, so I want you to put in your mind Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And really the next one will be Joshua, because I want you to take Numbers and shift it right up here beside Numbers. Deuteronomy, second telling of the law. We're going back over the law. There'll be a lot of repetition. We'll be going pretty quickly through it. 
But before we continue on with the story, which will happen in Joshua, Joshua is where we get to Jericho, where we get to Ai, where we get to entering the promised land, and it's really exciting. But now you have a parallel. Now you're going to say, there's a second telling of the law. Is it kind of all the same stuff all over again? And really, do we need? There's lots here. Yeah. Necromancy, astrology, occultic warnings, all kinds. But here's a fact for you that might bring you back for Deuteronomy. One that always, always interested me, and that is, did you know that Jesus quoted more? Write this down. Jesus quoted more from the book of Deuteronomy than any other book in the Old Testament. And there's a powerful scripture here that we're going to need every day as we live and breathe. It was the book that Jesus quoted from when the devil came tempting him. So powerful stuff ahead in the book of Deuteronomy. Don't miss it. And then we will go through that. We'll learn a lot. We'll go through it fairly quickly. And then when we get Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number and Deuteronomy together. And then we will come to Joshua and we'll continue with the story out into the promised land. Brothers and sisters and everybody listening, thank you for taking the time to especially bear with us today to accomplish this, to bring this to a close, especially with the introduction, everything at the beginning. It's gone longer than I would have wanted. Next week, we'll slow it down a pace and not go try to take on so much. I didn't take on so much just to get through it, but I thought it was good to wrap it up now. We've been quite a while in Deuteronomy with being away for a few weeks. I hope you've got the gist of this. Read back through it now in your own time. It's so rich, so much we can learn for our walk as we learn from what they went through and the struggles they had. And so next week, we'll take up the book of Deuteronomy. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for getting us through this portion of Scripture that we, we uh, Lord, many details, but we, we've got it, God, what's going on here in Numbers now, just the, the walk of the believer, Leviticus, the holiness that we need to have to have that walk right, and the, and the redemption that, that, that you, you paid price, you paid for us, and you set us free, and, and back to Genesis, Lord, all the beginnings and creation, and oh. so now, Lord, we pray uh, as we go out into the rest of this week, that you'd be with us all, and those who couldn't be here today, and those who are listening in today, and that, God, we pray your anointing and your empowering and your blessing, and we want to be like Joshua. We want to be people in whom is the Spirit of God. And we want to be people who are used by you in these the last days. So would you come and fill us, everyone listening right now, to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, like Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, I will go out of here, Lord, blessed to be a blessing to others. I meet all the needs, God. You know, we talked about some of them earlier. Every need, everyone here and everybody that's in struggling or difficulties or problems or trials or spirit, soul and body, that you would meet those needs, God, in a powerful way, uh, especially asking for that blessing at the close of our glorious time with you, glorious time around your word today. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's family said... Amen. 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 God bless you guys.